describe the media interest in this story? It's huge here. The Pegu County is a good job. I'm going to have to see it. It's lunes, and can see the most fair place for subsistence. Leave it to fun. No, I'm going to have to go in Thailand. To find the boys there is usually for the authorities and just for the nation in general, actually. In 2018, Every person on the planet was queued in, watching with bated breath at the horrifying event that played out in Thailand. A soccer team made up of 12 young boys and their coach trapped underground, while rescuers scrambled to get them out in time. Almost no disaster is without at least one fatality. How long would it be before they all succumbed to their entrapped predicament? Or would at least one of them make it out alive? Those teenagers didn't know it then, trapped in the dark, wet, cold, and afraid. But their horrifying ordeal made the world put their differences aside and stand together as one to bring them all out alive. No sign of life from 12 boys and their soccer coach. Here's the story of the kids who had every eye, heart, hope, and news station on the planet on them and the people who put their lives on the line to get them out. An impossible mission, an undertaking that had never been attempted before. With the elements against them, the divers went out, every one of them willing to put their lives on the line for those boys. The entrance to the Tam Luang Caves lies in the belly of the Doi Nang mountain range, which separates Thailand from Myanmar. The snaking six mile long limestone cave system is a popular place for tourists to visit during the dry season. It's truly magnificent with its winding passageways and relatively safe for even the most inexperienced explorers. Inevitably, the dry season is the busiest time for the caves. Prices skyrocket to profit as much as possible from the short time that they are open to the public. But come July in the off season, those prices drop significantly. For about three weeks, the locals take advantage of the lower prices and make their visit before the caves close for monsoon season. The caves are prone to flooding during the heavy rains that start in July. And rages on until October. It starts slow, gradually picking up in intensity for several weeks and the true monsoons reach their peak in September. But if you caught the season right at the end of May and the beginning of June, then you'd miss the rains and the torrents that they bring. Once the floods begin, the sinkholes fill up and thousands of new rivers appear, streaming down the mountain. Most of them find their way to the caves. By the end of July, the entire cave is flooded from top to bottom with not even a single air pocket left. And so it stands until November, when finally all the water drains out or gets sucked into the earth and human feet get to walk on the rocky floor of Tam Luang. A soccer team made up of 12 boys aged 11 to 16 was celebrating one of their team members' birthday. But honestly, Pira Pat's birthday was just an excuse to get the team away from the field for a change. Their assistant coach, 25-year-old Ekapol, wanted to reward his team for working so hard on the field for a while now. So he took the boys to the cool caves to explore for the day. They planned on returning late that afternoon, just in time for Pirapat's birthday party. They left their hometown, Mai Sai. Each boy and their coach rode their bicycles, their cleats tied to the handlebars. It was already raining when they left Mai Sai, but in a few hours, it became very clear that the rains were eager to descend upon Thailand earlier this year. By four that afternoon, the boys' parents were starting to get worried. Their sons weren't back from practice yet, and they still had a party to get ready for. Surely they should have started arriving back home by now. By five, the head coach, now flooded with calls from worried parents, tried phoning the assistant coach, but his calls were not going through to Ekapol's phone and none of the other boys' phones were working either. Then, one team member picked up his phone, but he wasn't with his team that day. The young man hadn't joined the outing because he'd come down with an illness. The coach went to the caves themselves to find them. When he arrived, 
All of the team's bicycles were parked at the entrance, their soccer cleats placed between their wheels on the floor, and the entrance to the cave had a literal river running straight into it. The head coach had grown up in the area, and he knew full well that the caves flooded shut every time the rains came. This was a very, very serious situation. Out of the breaking news overseas, 12 players and their coach missing. We don't know how far they have gone. He called the police immediately. Authorities snapped into action. The cave was partially flooded, meaning that if they were lucky, the children managed to find a place with a high enough elevation to keep them out of the water. They could very well still be alive. They called in every experienced cave diver in Thailand that they could get their hands on, and before midnight, they even had the Thai Navy SEALs on the line. They called up the British Cave Rescue Council, as they have some of the best cave rescue and exploration teams in the world. At first, they simply wanted advice on how to proceed in such circumstances, but when the British learned about the flooding, the size of the cave, and the speed at which the water was coming in, they were horrified and immediately offered to send everyone in all of Europe that were registered with them. The Thai government accepted the offer gratefully. This wouldn't be the first time the Brits were called in for rescues, but little did they know that the Thai cave rescue would turn out to be the most complicated attempt that any of them had ever taken on in the history of the Rescue Council. At eight that night, locals and authorities tried to go into the cave, but this proved to be a futile attempt. The water was so high and the tunnels were now completely flooded. The rain wasn't letting up and the gallons upon gallons just kept pouring in. The parents and volunteers were driven out by the streams, forced to wait in agony until the professionals arrived. There was no use trying to get in while it was dark, so they had no choice but to wait until morning. From the south entrance and the north entrance, water kept pouring in. But it wasn't just the rivers filling up the six-mile stretch of tunnels. All around the mountain, groundwater beneath the caves was rising too. As the earth soaked up the rain, the water was coming so fast and hard that the earth just couldn't absorb it anymore. To make matters worse, this place is huge, with offshoots and little tunnels creating a spiderweb maze. If the boys were still alive, they could be anywhere in the six-mile stretch of tunnels. There was just no way to tell. So the night wore on. Divers were flown in, equipment, pumps, and supplies were dropped off. Thailand natives were arriving from all over the country to help in any way they could, and the country was waiting with bated breath for news about the soccer team. Because when the news started to spread, those boys and their coach became the children of every Thai man and woman. The first wave of crowds were locals who brought food and blankets for the parents, and the men working to get the children out. Most of them didn't know each other. They just showed up to offer their support and prayers. And from that first night, that feeling of unity would spread to every corner of the earth. When the sun rose the next morning, the children had been down there all night, in the dark, with no contact, no light, and no food or clean water. Everyone just had to hope that the boys thought to stuff their pockets with snacks, or maybe a few bottles of water to keep them for a while. The first reports started making their rounds on international television and social media. The world was slowly becoming aware of the situation. Vernon Unsworth, a British diver who happened to be in Thailand to explore the very caves that he was now being called in for a rescue mission, arrived. Vernon was an accomplished diver, and he'd been studying the caves for years. He'd been down there on several occasions, making him one of the only people in the world to experience the caves when they were filled with muddy, murky water. His in-depth knowledge of every opening leading into the system was second to none. No one could have asked for a better expert on Tam Luang. Authorities leaned heavily on Vernon's expertise as he led them through every map they could find and some of Vernon's own sketches. He walked them through the highest elevations, the places where there were dry ledges, and the most likely places where the boys could survive the rising water levels, if they managed to make it to one of them, that is. He showed them the other entrances he knew about that weren't known to the public 
and with that men set out to see if they could make it inside from another angle. The entire Sunday was spent trying to get inside without diving equipment from every single entrance that Vernon showed them. The goal was to see how far they could get in. All the while, more divers and equipment were arriving from the Navy in Europe. For the first few feet, the water was already up to the caver's shoulders and necks. Other parts were completely flooded from ceiling to floor. There was just no way anyone could get in without the use of scuba gear. The only way that the boys could still be alive was if they managed to find a ledge or a passageway that was higher than the rest. But even this would only be enough to buy them some time. The rain slowed down to a trickle, but that didn't stop the water from rising. The entire mountain acted as a funnel, sending every drop down to the entrance. Sooner or later, there would be no more pockets of air left at all. People started putting up tents, kitchens and medical bays in the surrounding areas. The news on social media had spread like wildfire. Images of the boys and their coaches' faces, their parents, friends, and extended family holding vigils and continuously praying are viewed by millions of people online. On day three, any food and drinkable water the children might have had would have run out by now, and if they are indeed still alive, every day trapped inside brings them one day closer to starvation or death from disease from drinking the contaminated mountain water. The Thai Navy SEALs had arrived. They took every map and layout that had been collected of the caves and started focusing on the areas that had the highest elevations. If anyone was still alive, it would be in these air pockets. One area in particular, Pattaya Beach, stood out to them. It was large enough to keep the whole soccer team and their coach, and it was higher up than almost all of the other options before them. But there were two problems with this. One, Pattaya Beach is almost two miles from the cave entrance, and it's just the closest possible option to the entrance. There are about half a dozen other places where they could be trapped after Pattaya Beach, Pattaya was just the closest and most likely option, the best place to start. And two, 90% of the way to any of them would mean going through water that was so muddy and dirty that there would virtually be no way to see more than a foot in front of the diver's eyes, no matter how many flashlights they brought down with them. They'd be going in completely blind. The biggest worry was getting turned around. Down there in the dark, with all of the rock walls looking exactly the same, Getting lost and scrambling your internal compass was a death sentence. Panicking for just a moment is enough to make a diver mistake left from right and up from down. In that state, not even the natural pull of gravity that we so unconsciously rely on is enough to bring a man back from the confusion and hysteria that can grip you. So they led a bright red rope behind them and every diver that came in after that point could at least follow the lead rope to the last point, extend it a few more feet and follow it back. If a diver had one hand on the rope at all times, finding his way was almost certain. The Navy worked in tandem, each man taking the rope a few feet farther than the one before. Inch by inch they start making progress. At least if anyone had died, they were sure to have found a body by now or some possessions, but they found nothing, so the glimmer of hope remained. The European and British divers have been debriefed. It's taken them a whole day to get the layout of the caves with help from Verne and translators. As the foreign divers start heading out for the first time, pumps are set up to try and evacuate some of the water, but their efforts are futile. The waves of water are just too much for pumps to possibly compete with, so even more pumps are brought in. Thai Navy SEALs are trained for sea and river diving, but they have virtually no background in cave diving. But the Brits do, so they start coaching the Navy through the process. And the Thais learned quickly they end up being the ones who lead the trail rope the farthest into the cave on day four. News crews have set up camp and every second of the rescue mission is now being filmed. Like a macabre season of Big Brother, the world tunes in, watching with bated breath. Rainfall picks up again and it temporarily stalls search efforts, while the new nine pumps continue to run in the background. These are the biggest machines in circulation, 
and most of them have been donated by neighboring countries. The current speed and height balloons with the torrential tropical rains forcing dives to be put on hold for their own safety. John Valanthan and Rick Stanton arrive. They're the last of the British cave divers to get there. And no one has a more decorated background than these two. Both men started diving as teenagers. Behind them, they've assisted in more diving operations and rescue missions than they could count. Firefighting, marathons, dangerous dives, if there's a death-defying activity that pushes the human body to the limit, they were probably doing it for years already. In a desperate attempt to drain more water, the Thai government brought in every ounce of manpower they could find. Military personnel and volunteers swarm the mountain. Making use of plastic pipes and even cutting down bamboo stalks by hand, they try to revert water away from the sinkholes that leak into the caves, while others are still searching for openings that lead into the tunnels. The ones they find have entire rivers flowing into them and they're too small for a human to fit into. So they dig farrows to redirect the streams and rivers. They start drilling holes into the mountain, hoping to create more places for the water to exit from. But this is a long and arduous task that could take months to accomplish. By the time they finally make it through, any survivors would have starved to death but they go on anyway, hoping to strike it lucky and get a wall thin enough to save them some valuable time. It's been one week since the team and their coach went missing. The efforts on top of the mountain are paying off. They weren't able to drill through the mountain yet, but their pumps, newly built farrow system, and draining the sinkholes are bearing the fruits of their hard work. Levels in the cave are going down, even with the rain still pouring from the heavens. The rain hasn't stopped yet, but it's lessened down to a sprinkle again, allowing the divers, both foreign and high seals, to go down. The US Navy, Australia and China are all there to aid in the search. This was now an international affair. The world is ablaze with the news and vigils and prayer sessions are held for the boys on every continent and almost every country on the globe. Celebrities are chiming in, among them the billionaire Elon Musk. He offers to build a child-sized submarine to capsule the boys out in. He makes a big show of the idea and even starts building it, but he never manages to produce a workable sub, and still no sign of the boys. No bodies, clothes, cell phones, or any of their belongings have been found inside the cave or in the dams of water that have been pumped out. An evacuation plan is now in place. If they find any survivors, their extraction and transport to the nearest hospital are set up and ready to go. The water has been drained so much that the entire entrance section of the cave is almost completely clear. Divers go down again and it's the Thai seals that reach the one mile mark. They also reach Pattaya Beach, but Pattaya Beach is empty. The divers, the parents and the world are devastated Almost all of their hopes had been placed on Pattaya. On a dry ledge, a mile into the tunnels, they set up a staging bank where extra oxygen and supplies are stored. This is also where divers reconvene between dives. A huddle place, if you will. John Valanthan and Rick Stanton were the first ones to go into the cave that morning. From the staging bank, they were planning on covering a few more meters than the day before. Usually divers start heading back when their tanks are still three quarters of the way full. That way, they'll have half a tank for the journey back and a little to spare in case something goes wrong. Valanthan and Stanton were already at their limit point. They were supposed to go back. Instead, they went against the usual safety procedures they decided to go on for a few more minutes. Just a few feet ahead was another air pocket right above their heads. With his camera held in front of him, one of the divers had his hand out and into the air pocket before his head even surfaced. Back outside, the live stream caught an astounding sight just seconds before the divers' heads surfaced and saw it for themselves. Twelve boys and one adult huddled on a ledge, illuminated by the flashlight attached to the camera. After almost ten days of being trapped without food or any light, 
every single boy and their coach was finally found. The cheers that erupted from the encampment set up outside the entrance were so loud that the townspeople heard it. Within the hour, millions of people around the world were aware of the discovery. To say that this was miraculous is an understatement. After a week and a half, everyone involved was just hoping that they would find one, maybe two or three survivors, probably barely clinging on to life after their extended starvation and the viruses and bacteria that were almost certain to have made host to the weak boys. Most people expected to find 13 dead bodies by now. But no, against all the odds, all 13 were alive. The soccer team's families and the world rejoiced. One of the boys could speak English and he and the Brits were able to communicate. They assured the kids that more people were coming, they just needed to hang in there for a little while longer. And with that, Volanthan and Stanton were forced to leave them in the dark again. But their relief was short-lived. The grueling past 10 days were just the beginning. Now came the hard part. Now they had to think of a way to get them out. The wild boar soccer team still had a long and impossible road ahead of them. A Thai military doctor was sent in next. Lieutenant Colonel Pak Loharachun had diving and medical experience and he could speak their language. Pak arrived and inspected the children and their coach. Everyone was in remarkably good shape. They only had minor cuts and scrapes on their bare feet that came from running for cover when the torrents of water chased them deeper into the abyss. They'd lost a significant amount of weight and everyone was weak from their ordeal. They were given clean water and food, but their food had to be limited. After more than a week without sustenance, it could be dangerous to give them too much at once. The children and their coach needed to be fed in slow and steady increments, increasing their intake over time to keep their already weakened bodies from reacting negatively to the sudden onslaught of nutrition. Pak learned that their coach, Ekapol, was a former Buddhist monk. And in an attempt to keep the boys calm and to give them something to do while they were crammed on the ledge, he'd taught them to meditate. These simple meditation lessons are probably what saved their lives. Going into a meditative state slows the body as well as the mind. Their breathing and metabolism slowed and their bodies broke down their reserves at a slower pace, meaning they could live off their stored fats for a few days longer than most skinny children their age could have. The parents took an unusual route when they found out that their sons were alive. Instead of blaming the teacher for taking the kids to the cave, without taking the danger of the rains into account. They instead sent him letters, thanking him for keeping their children alive and sane, despite the desperate and hopeless situation down there in the dark. With Ekapol's letters, the parents, of course, sent their own children letters full of love and hope. After almost 10 days of cold misery and certain that they were going to die slow and painful deaths, the children were overjoyed. Footage of them greeting their families went viral, showing them smiling and giving the proper Thai greetings with their hands and heads bowed. Lieutenant Colonel Loharisham, not caring about what instructions his superiors had in mind for him, informed the divers that he was going to stay with the kids until every last one of them was extracted. Now the teams above needed to figure out a way to get the children out safely. None of the 13 had any diving experience and most of the children couldn't even swim. To make matters worse, the oxygen in the cave, now supplying the children and the divers coming in and out, was being used up faster than fresh air could come in. Before plans for an extraction could even begin, they needed to rectify the depleting oxygen levels. By manually taking in canisters of oxygen, they managed to keep levels from plummeting. This was a grueling and intensely time-consuming undertaking, with divers going in and out in tandem at all hours of the day and night. Leaving them there until the rain stopped was not an option. Monsoon season lasted for months. Keeping them there would drive them insane, no matter what supplies you sent down to keep them occupied. The damp conditions made infections and diseases almost sure to take hold. It was already a minor miracle that none of them showed signs of fevers or gangrene already. 
Drilling a hole from the top was the next idea, but the level of danger to that was just too high. Besides risking fractures and a subsequent cave-in, it would take a month or more to drill through the mountain. In the week and a half that they'd been trying just to make small drainage holes, they'd been unsuccessful. The only possibility was to send divers in to get the children one by one and swim them out. The boys and their coach start diving lessons. While oxygen is still constantly brought into their cavern, the rains aren't letting up and the water levels are increasing again. After 10 days of pumping, barely keeping the boys' feet above the waterline, their efforts aren't enough anymore. Monsoon season is now in full swing. Extra pumps are brought in, now totaling nine pumps in all, and more furrows are dug, and every ounce of manpower is put into draining more water. The attempt to drill through the mountain has now been completely discarded. The men manning the machines were put to use on the furrows and redirection of water instead. Lessons continue and there is a forecast of huge storms on the way. If something isn't done soon, no matter how many pumps are put to work, there'd be no way to keep up with the water anymore. Everyone still inside the cave had a week or less before they all drowned while the world watched in horror. On the outside, the British team, who were going to be the ones to go in to bring them out, were running drills in a swimming pool with the help of some local school children who'd volunteered to help out. The Thai government did not let pride stand in the way of bringing their kids out. They stepped aside and let the British make the calls. There was no one better to hand over the mantle of command to than the British Cave Rescue Council and Vernon Unsworth. Vernon knew the place best, and the council were the best divers the world has to offer. At 1 a.m. in the morning, a diver, delivering another bottle of oxygen, dies in the tunnels. Saman Gunan delivered the tank to the children, and on the way back with the previous empty bottle in hand, exhausted and overworked, the man died, presumably when the murky water got him turned around and he ran out of oxygen. Officer Gunam was an experienced diver, and he had a crystal clear track record on every one of his dives. If even the Navy man couldn't make it, then how could a group of teens with only a few days of lessons manage to get out alive? The world wasn't quite aware of just how dire the situation was, but the teams on the ground did. They were already stressed, tired, and desperate for solutions, painfully aware of the fact that time was running out and that the boys' chances of surviving the dive out were terribly slim. Spirits weren't high to begin with, and the death of Officer Gunam shattered what little morale they still had left. What brought them through was the support streaming in from every corner of the globe. People were sending flowers, care packages, donations, and well wishes at such a pace that there was no keeping up with the constant shower of trust and grace that the world bestowed on every diver, soldier, and operator. It wasn't just experience and expertise that made this rescue possible. The hope and human spirit did just as much as the individual's qualifications did. There was no more time to dwell on the danger. The storms were coming in faster than previously predicted. Whatever time they thought they still had, had now run out. To everyone's shock, the announcement that extraction would commence the very next day. With water levels rising and the pumps barely managing to keep up, search and rescue had no choice. The boys weren't nearly ready to take on a dive that, even the experts agreed, was the most challenging conditions they'd ever gone under before. The biggest pitfall was fear. If one of the boys panicked, submerged under pitch black water, with only their accompanying diver's headlight for comfort, it would be a death sentence. Irregularities in their breathing and erratic movements could flood the boys with toxic amounts of carbon dioxide from the tanks, leading to carbon dioxide toxicity. This was the very risk that led them to consider drilling through an entire mountain instead of having the boys dive themselves in the first place. The solution? sedate everyone before they go under. 
not enough to render them unconscious, but just enough to enforce the calm the divers needed to get them out without the deadly stress, fear, and panic setting in. The cocktail they would be given consisted of Valium and ketamine, enough to put them in a state of dissociative anesthesia. They'd be conscious enough to breathe on their own, but just far enough under the influence to render them incapable of voluntary movement. Then, all 13 would be kitted out with full face masks, removing the hassle of keeping a separate mouthpiece in place. Finally, each boy in their coach would be fastened to the chest of the diver taking them out. That way, the diver would be responsible for all movement and navigation, and if they hit the rock walls, the diver's back would take the hit, essentially using his own body to shield the survivors. It was sink or swim, so to speak. Now or never, live or die. The last day before extraction began, everyone inside the cave ran through their drills one last time. In the past few days of diving lessons, several of the boys even learned how to swim. They went to sleep under their silver space blankets that night, getting all of the rest that they could before the big day. Dawn came on that fateful Sunday, and every camera and every member of the various teams, or at least those not manning the pumps, stood by as the divers went down, hoping, praying, that the next time they saw one of them, they'd be accompanied by one of the children. The day was called D-Day. Everyone felt like they were preparing for war. One final conflict, one last chance at freedom. Now or never. While parents and family prayed by the religious shrines set up by them at the cave entrance. Thirteen ambulances, one for each victim, alive or dead, stood, engines running, and ready to speed each child and the coach to the airfield, where helicopters were waiting for takeoff. In Bangkok, medical staff were waiting, and surgical rooms were already prepped, just in case. The plan was that one diver would swim to the boys, fasten a sedated child onto him, and on his way back, the diver would pass the child over to another diver to take over at one of the five air pockets available to them. In these caverns, on the way to the entrance, spare oxygen tanks were placed. At every waypoint, the child would be handed over, step by step, until they reached the entrance to the cave where ambulances were waiting. Like a perfectly executed and timed game of relay. Only this was no race, this was life or death. Among themselves, the boys decided who would go first. They thought that they would have to drive their bicycles home themselves after exiting the cave. The team hadn't mentioned the enormous setup, police, military and ambulances outside. The boys needed to stay calm, and they were afraid that the knowledge of crowds and medical and military personnel would make the children more nervous than they could afford for them to be. So the information was withheld from them for now. The boys decided that the ones who lived the farthest away should get to go out first. They insisted that their coach fall into the line of living order too. With the crowds waiting and the divers fueled by the world's hope, the first diver went down. When he reached the soccer team, he took the first boy and started heading out. Some places in the tunnels were only two feet wide and other stretches were 15 minutes of diving time between waypoints. It was slow, difficult and already rife with problems from the get-go. The first Euro diver got his face mask stuck to the roof of one of the narrowest points. With one hand holding the lead rope, he tried to free himself, but he was unable to free himself one-handed. Left with no other choice, he was forced to release his only lifeline so that he could use both hands. Miraculously, he was able to grope around and find the lead rope again. If he lost that rope, he and the boy would have died before rescuers could reach them. One by one, the boys emerged from the entrance to cheering and jubilant crowds. The parents weren't told which child was in the ambulance that passed them. They needed the boys, the families, and the rescue personnel's morale to stay positive. If one of the children died, the devastation would crush everyone's spirits. Until everyone was out, names and conditions were kept hush-hush. The rest of the first day went without any further problems. 
and the first four boys to be taken out, starting with Prashak, were Prachak, Natawut, Faipat, and an unnamed fourth child. Every time a stretcher appeared, the crowds of people went wild with joy. It didn't matter whose boy came out, the parents celebrated with each other. Whoever it was, they had no idea, but at least one more was out. The children were airlifted to Bumrungrad International Hospital in Bangkok. In the helicopter, they all came down with hypothermia the moment their skin made contact with the open air. But their conditions were stable and they wouldn't come out of their sedation until the next morning. The next day, three more children and their coach came out. And on the last day, the final five were extracted. The last child to come out into the open air was Monkan. One by one, the ambulances went by. And when the last one rode off, the parents finally found out that every one of their children and their coach were alive. Besides the mishap with the first diver's mask, there were no more hiccups during the extraction. All of them were hypothermic, but none were seriously ill. Everyone was stable, in good spirits, and asking for their parents and siblings. The families were reunited with their sons on day 17. The ward was set up in such a way that all 13 could be treated together, always in each other's sights. Treating them were almost 150 medical staff that took shifts to ensure that they were under constant supervision. But the kids only needed to wait for the sedation to wear off and be kept warm. They were all in remarkably good shape. Against the odds, after 17 days underground, their only serious health concern was reintroducing a balanced diet after starving for those first 10 days and wearing sunglasses. Their eyes needed protection from natural light after being in the dark for so long. The coach was in the worst shape of all. During those first few days, he'd given what little food they had to the children. And of them all, he was the most malnourished and had the worst case of hypothermia. Ekapol was still medically stable. He just needed a little more care than the others before he could be released. Every few days, a new report came out, reassuring the public that all was well and everyone was stable. Technically, the last day was day 18. The cavern still had two doctors inside that needed to come out and an enormous amount of equipment that included ropes, oxygen tanks, spare masks, an entire pulley system, medical supplies, blankets, and dozens of divers still spread out at the waypoints. The pumps and heavy machinery all needed to be packed up too. And then the real trouble started. Seven of the nine pumps gave out. After more than two weeks of working overtime, the machinery just couldn't keep up anymore. The cave's water levels rose dangerously fast, the current now so strong that divers and the doctors at the very end were barely able to get out in time. They were forced to leave almost all of the equipment behind. The crowd was still there, and the boys' families also came out to thank the men who saved their sons' lives. Every time a worker, diver, or any person involved in the mission came out, they cheered as hard and as loud as they did for every child. Waiting for them in the last tent still standing was KFC and some Jack Daniels whiskey. And there, the teams, all hailing from multiple countries, ate and drank their exhaustion and relief away. The rains were free to flood the caves to the brim again, the sinkholes filled up, and for the rest of the monsoon season, Tam Luen Caves stood desolate. Four months later, they opened for business like usual, after clearing out the remains of ropes, oxygen tanks, and silver space blankets that couldn't be retrieved when the pumps failed. The ledge where the boys were trapped for 17 days is still the biggest attraction to this day. After their ordeal, most of the children did relatively well, but coach Ekapol suffered from a deep depression feeling responsible for putting the boys in such danger. But Thailand rallied behind the 25-year-old, and by the time he was released from hospital, the Wild Boars Football Club had more new students signed up than they could accommodate. 
The parents and the whole of Thailand agreed that there was no one better to keep their children alive and safe than the former Buddhist monk. All 13 were suddenly the center of attention, making many appearances on television shows, including the Ellen DeGeneres show. All of them were offered scholarships at some of the best universities in the world. Most of them took the offer and went on to study in various fields. Sadly, one of them, Dwangpech Promthep, or Dom, the team captain, was found dead in England, where he was studying at Brookhouse College on a football scholarship. He was found unconscious in his dormitory room, suffering from a head injury. He died two days later in hospital. Even though Dom was depressed before his death, and the media jumped on the theory that he took his own life, authorities don't suspect suicide or foul play. It seems that it really was just a terrible accident. To say that the impossible occurred is an enormous understatement. Never in the history of amazing rescues has there ever been an event that was as monumental as this. The elements were against them in every way possible. And yet, despite the odds, the teams managed to get every single boy and their coach out alive. The moment of the decade that brought the world together. The Tamluan Cave rescue will go down in history. If only mankind could rally together for corruption, war and hardship, as we did for the Wild Boars soccer team, we'd be living in a very, very different world, wouldn't we? If you've enjoyed this story, please like, subscribe and share with us your thoughts in the comment section below.